we've been in a series called Through Jesus' Eyes, and we've been saying that often it's difficult to make progress in an issue, thinking through something in your life, until someone comes along and helps you to see it from a completely different perspective and a different angle. Jesus' words had that kind of impact, and so we're going back to Luke's gospel. We've been in chapter 6, and just trying to understand his perspective on uh, the kinds of issues and uh, challenges that we all face in life. Today we're looking at how Jesus calls us to love our enemies. And probably there is no easier way to begin to identify some of our own heart attitudes in this area than thinking about uh, our time on the road. Uh, I understand uh, one study said nearly 80% of drivers had experienced some form of road rage in the last year. Uh, 51% said they had purposely tailgated someone. You know, you did this to me, I'm after you. Uh, 47% said that they had yelled at another driver. Uh, 45% said that they had angrily honked at someone. Uh, A third of people had made angry gestures of some kind. And 24% tried to block uh, another driver from, uh, from getting into their lane. They were, they were going to make them pay and, and deal with them in, in some of those aggressive ways. Now, there are probably some of you that are thinking, mm, yep, 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 yeah, I, I do all of those things. And there are others of you who are probably thinking, ah, that's not me. I don't think I have a problem with that. Well, maybe you don't, but maybe you express your road rage in more passive-aggressive ways. Um, so, for instance, one, one of the, maybe you have found yourself in a parking lot and ever think you're sitting waiting for someone to get out of their parking spot. And you're thinking, I think that they're deliberately taking a long time to get out of their spot because I'm sitting waiting here. Ever, ever thought that? Well, it was probably true. They've actually done studies on this, and if there's no one around, it takes on average 39 seconds for uh, uh, 32 seconds for a car to pull out of their parking space in your average uh, shopping mall. If somebody is waiting with their indicator on, it takes them not 32 seconds, it takes them an average seven seconds longer, 39 seconds then heaven forbid that the person should get impatient and honk your horn. Anyone think that might be the answer? If I just honk, that will make them move quicker. Actually, it it doesn't. Then it'll take an average of 43 seconds for the person to come out of their car, uh, out of their parking spot and let you in. Any of you, that driver? Anyone take your your anger out on other drivers in passive-aggressive ways? You're going to... Make them pay with a clock and make them wait and not let them in and and do some of these things that we can express our displeasure and get a little bit of road justice uh, as we are uh, going about our our days. Well, uh, we we deal with those, those kinds of things, and this isn't a sermon on road rage or how to drive like Jesus, but if we're going to talk about how to love your enemies it's important that we begin to identify who those people might be and how uh, we can uh, respond in ways that would reflect uh, the Savior that we, uh, we claim to follow. And so that's what we're doing this morning. Uh, if you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 6. I'll be reading from verses 27 to 36 in the Black Church Bible under the seat in front of you. It's on page 810. And again, starting at Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, 
What credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is the word of God. Now let's start with the command that is really at the heart and driving force of this passage, uh, the command uh, to love our enemies. He, J- Jesus is calling us to love the people that we don't like or maybe to love the people that don't like us. Uh, he's not, he's not when, he, when we're talking about love, we're not talking about warm fuzzies or uh, these uh, just feelings of love. He's talking about concrete action. So he's calling us to love the people that we don't like or maybe the people that don't like us. Now, when you see that, that uh, opening command in verse 27, to love your enemies, some people get a little defensive. And they'll say, oh, I don't have any enemies. I, don't, I, I just don't see anyone like that in my life. I try not to think of people as my enemies. And, and that's, that's a good and healthy way to approach things. When Jesus uses the term enemies here, uh, he is using it in a, in a sense uh, of people that both you don't like and people that, that don't like you. And he spells that out for us a little bit in the descriptions in verses 27 to 30. He mentions those who hate you, those who curse you, or those who abuse you. And by abuse, he's, he's talking about uh, verbal abuse, people are, who are calling you names and, and saying things in that, in that regard. So your enemies would include people who don't show your, share your politics, people who don't share your values. Uh, they, they would include people who disrespect you, people who rub you the wrong way. Uh, they're the people who cut you off in traffic, and yes, the people who take 43 seconds on average to get out of their parking space when you're trying to get in to do your shopping. Uh, all of those people are included in what Jesus refers to as our enemies. And uh, again, he says to love them. But again, not just with warm feelings. He gets intensely practical, gives us some specific ways that he expects us to treat people who may not, uh, who would otherwise mistreat us. Uh, the examples he gives, he says, do good to them, bless them, and pray for them. And that's a good list to keep in the back of your mind. Do good to them, bless them, and pray for them. While I was preparing this message, and whenever I have a sermon, whatever the topic is, I can often anticipate that God will bring circumstances into my life to help me to understand and apply it. But while I was preparing this particular sermon, I got a phone call from someone who decided to let me have it. Don't worry, it wasn't any of you, but uh, someone just unloaded on me. And uh, I, I came out of that phone call, and I thought... I had, uh, I was at least glad that I hadn't kind of returned it and that I hadn't uh, said anything that I regretted. But as I was thinking about this passage, I thought, I didn't, I didn't do anything good for them. I didn't bless them. I didn't offer to pray for them. And it's that, those kind of practical steps that Jesus is calling us to make to the people who don't like us other people uh, that we are, are, are struggling to love, people who, uh, who are just more, more it's a more difficult relationship for us. I, I was at the uh, Fellowship Regional Conference this, uh, uh, this week, and one of the church planters gave uh, an update, a report on his ministry and some of the things that were going on. Uh, they had begun ministry in this town, and they were using... A, uh, a particular facility, a concert venue, where they were holding their Sunday worship services. And one day they got a, a call from someone, uh, the, the uh, activity coordinator for that particular uh, concert hall, and she was very apologetic. She said, I feel awful having to tell you this, but we're going to have to cancel our contract. We're no longer going to be able to Uh, rent the facility to you. And she went on to explain, she says, you have been great tenants, so we had a great relationship, but unfortunately, 
uh, one of our directors on uh, the board for our organization uh, learned of your connection with a, an, uh, uh, another church and their view on sexuality. And the board discussed this and just decided we, we, we can't allow you to continue to use this facility. Um, terribly sorry, but we're going to have to call it quits. Well, she had that painful conversation, and you can imagine the church planter now scrambling to think, what are we going to be doing on Sundays? Uh, no sooner had she announced this to, uh, to the church planter, she said, again, I feel absolutely awful uh, saying this to you, but we have a concert uh, lined up for this Friday, and we don't have anyone to, to do the sound. Would you happen to know of anyone who would be available? And sure enough, the church sound team showed up and showed the love of Jesus Christ, uh, was able to provide help and just a practical demonstration of, uh, of uh, responding to a need of someone who you'd think, ah, this, is, this has caused a great uh, frustration and, and challenge for us. This is where we show love. This is how we demonstrate that uh, our, our Savior has called us to something different. When I heard that uh, report, I thought of uh, a quote by uh, a man by the name of Russ Ford. He was a chaplain on death row. And he, he said the following, Jesus didn't teach us to love our enemies for their good. He said, said that for our own good, that we would keep from becoming the enemy." And I think, I think that we live in a time where if we don't get this right, we will become the enemy. We live, at least in my, uh, in my lifetime, I feel like this is the most divisive, polarized time that our culture has been in. And if we don't learn to love our enemies, we will, be, we will begin to act like the enemy. Uh, we will begin to uh, turn into something that we're, we're not and, and we're certainly not called to be. In trying to defend Christian, we'll end up failing to be Christian. Now, before we move on, it's important that we understand what Jesus is not saying. This is just a short little description. Jesus is giving some, some uh, brief comments without a lot of nuance or without going into the exceptions. He's just giving us the highlights of, some, of an ethic that is at the heart of his teaching. But there's things that we need to, we need to clarify. We need to uh, come to terms with what he is not saying here. So, for instance, uh, if you think give to everyone who begs from you is a blanket commandment that every time someone puts out their hand or comes up to you and says, I want lots of money, you've got to just hand it over then you're probably not going to understand uh, verses like 2 Thessalonians 3.10, where Paul said, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And so we re recognize there's, there's some nuance going on here. There, there's a little bit of detail that is uh, not being spelled out here, but is understood this is the main thrust. Or if you think that turn the other cheek means you have to let people clobber you every time they, wanna, they want to... Uh, impose their will on you, then you're probably going to struggle to understand the many passages in Acts where you've got the Apostle Paul, anytime there is kind of threats of violence, the church comes around him and make sure they get him out of the, get him out of the scene, protect him, and he is sent off to another town. And so those, those kinds of, of nuances aren't built into our passage here, uh, but are things that we, we understand from the rest of Scripture. So loving your enemies may mean being exposed to insult, but doesn't mean you invite violence. Uh, loving your enemies never, uh, never, it may mean we confront injustice rather than just receive it. Loving your spouse never means that you uh, just sit there passively on the receiving end of abuse. That, that's not what this is teaching, but it is giving us a, a basic response to the evil in our world uh, is one 
that we seek to, to model the love and the grace, the mercy that we have seen in our Father towards us. So we said Jesus calls us to love the people that we don't like. Next, we see that at Love is also the basis for Jesus' rewards. The Bible doesn't, doesn't anywhere list that there are uh, rewards in heaven for those who attended the most church activities. There aren't any rewards in heaven for the person who prayed the longest prayer. But the Bible does specify that uh, there are rewards for those who uh, love the people that they don't like, the people, when you love the people that don't like you. And so we'll, we'll walk into that. Now, our world tends to celebrate people who are good friends and good family members. People who love their friends are celebrated. People who love their family are, they were seen as a good family person. And we, we, we hold that up as something that is worthy in our culture today. And those are good things. But they're not particularly Christian things. So look at verse 32. Even sinners love those who love them. Or verse 33, even sinners do good to those who do good to them. Now, you know, when you're driving along the road and you let someone in who waits patiently and signals appropriately, when you do that, that may be a good thing to do. It is not a particularly Christian thing to do. There's no Christian virtue in that. That's just basic human action, everybody does that. Uh, similarly, when you lend money to someone who, uh, you know, they're your friend, you, you, you're, you're almost certain they're going to pay you back, that, that's not a particularly Christian thing to do, that's just a human thing to do. Everybody does that. And, and so he, he's kind of spelling, uh, spelling out some of these normal expressions of love and saying, yeah, Everybody does that stuff. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a different kind of love. And it's important that he spells that out because in his day, as well as in our own, uh, so much of what we celebrate as uh, heroic acts of love are just people uh, doing good to, for, to others from whom they expect fully that they'll likely receive back from in, 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 in similar ways. Uh, in similar ways. And so, again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not particularly Christian. And so there is no reward in it. That's why he says in verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? And in fact, he will repeat that, that same question three times from 32 to 34. What benefit? What benefit? What credit? Each time using the word, uh, it's a Greek word, charis, meaning grace, He's saying, what grace is there in that? You don't require any of God's grace to show that kind of love, so you, don't, you, you shouldn't expect any grace. This is just basic human relationships. Everybody does those things. But when we love people that we don't like, when we love people who don't like us, it's another story. Look what he says in verse 35. There the promise is, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, implication, nothing in return from them, and your reward will be great. When you do things that you're not expecting anyone, the the person to, to respond to, the person to recognize, it's then that you can expect something from God. This is a promise you can that you can claim when. A friend betrays you and you decide to show kindness anyway. This is a promise you can, you can claim when you show love to your teen when they have their back turned against you. It's a promise that you can claim when you stick at it in ministry when the returns aren't there. When you just seem to be getting nothing back, nothing in return. And you continue to persevere. The message is God will reward you for the love that you show in hard places. Now, some of the most miraculous expressions of this love, we kind of think, oh, this is, you know, thousands of years ago, I guess people were able to do that. But, you know, we can barely manage to hold it together on the, on the highway. In, in our day, uh, we are continuing to see 
uh, expressions of this kind of love. Uh, for me, where it has the most dramatic examples have come out of uh, the South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, sessions. I read of one woman who, uh, she had uh, uh, an experience where her 18-year-old son uh, was first uh, taken by uh, some police officers. The, 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 uh, the person in the head of things, a man by the name of Officer Vandebroek, uh, killed her son at point blank range. He then, with other officers, uh, went on to uh, party while her son's body was burning in the midst of them. Eight years later, that same officer, Vandebroek, returned, uh, returned to that neighborhood, returned to that home, and he dragged out her husband, in, and uh, he killed her while making... Uh, while making his wife watch all of this. Shockingly, the last words that she heard her husband utter before he was killed was, to his wife, forgive them. Years later, Officer Vanderbrook, or former Officer Vanderbrook, was, uh, was brought before the commission, and uh, the, the wife, the widow, was asked, what do you want? What do you want us to do? What, what could we do to bring justice to this situation? And having thought of things, she asked for three. Uh, she first asked that she wanted the officer to take her to where her dead husband's uh, body had, where, where he had been killed, so he could, she could offer some kind of decent burial. Second, she said, Mr. Vandebroek took all my family away from me, and I still have a lot to give. Twice a month, I would like for him to come and visit me so I can be a mother to him. And finally, she said, I'd like Mr. Vandebroek to know that he can be forgiven by God and that I forgive him. I'd like someone to lead me to where he is seated, seated so I can embrace him and he can know that my forgiveness is real. And I, I, I hear that, and I just feel, as you likely feel, that kind of love is, it just doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel attainable. It doesn't, uh, again, we struggle with someone taking 32 seconds to get out of their parking spot when we're out shopping, and this woman has demonstrated a level of love and forgiveness for her enemy that is hard to understand. And yet the promise of scripture is that she will receive a, uh, a reward from, from God that no earthly court could ever give. She will receive her justice, uh, but it will come from the hand of another. And it is that kind of love that, that we are called to. But understanding what this love is still doesn't show us how do we do that? Like, how do we get from shaking my fist at someone who just cut me off in traffic to be able to show this kind of love to someone who has done terrible evil towards me? How do you, what, what, what is the line between those, those two? How do I get from here to there? Obviously, it has to start with God, has to start with a relationship with God. But uh, he, here we come to terms with the fact that uh, Jesus loves you when there's nothing to like about you. Obsessing, as we often do, over the world's definition of love, the world's kind of love, uh, we end up loving like very much like the world does. We end up showing the, the, the depth of love that the world does. And it is only changing our, uh, the love that we obsess over from this world's definition to a God who loves with, uh, with, with a, a, a depth and a, a strength that our world doesn't know that we begin, we begin to be able to uh, love in ways that reflect his. And so we start by saying, Jesus loves you when there's nothing to like about you. Now, let's first clarify the message of verse 35. It says, 
Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Now, we've already said that the whole, uh, we saw this last time, the entire message is directed to Jesus' disciples. And he begins this passage by saying, but to you who hear, he's talking about people with their eyes of faith opened, a relationship with God begun, they are committed already to following as his disciples, and, and that is the basis of all that he says here. So he's not saying, love your enemies, and that's how you become a Christian. That's how you become sons of the Most High. No, he's saying, love your enemies, and that's how you show that you are sons of the Most High. That's how you show that you have genuine faith, that you have come to know a Savior who loves his enemies. And so it's only as you show that kind of love that that becomes clear. And many of you, most of us, at some point in our life, we face struggles. We, we, we ask questions about our faith. Am, am I real? Is, is, is my faith genuine? Have I really come to know Jesus or am I just going through the motions? Jesus is saying, you can know. As you begin to demonstrate this kind of supernatural love in your life, you can see what you, you can see that you have begun to receive that supernatural love. You, you can see that there is something real operating in your life because you're showing it. And so understanding whether we have in fact received this kind of love is our basic starting point. And maybe you've said, love of Jesus, of course, I'm all about that. Well, let's not assume anything. Jesus didn't just love enough to avoid honking at, honking at people who were, you know, their, their, their donkey wasn't moving fast enough. He, he had a deeper love, with, love than that. He loved his enemies to the point of dying for them. He took the penalty for uh, sinners, uh, their rightful penalty. He volunteered to take it in their place. And so through faith, we can know forgiveness and acceptance with God. For you and I, it is very easy for us to agree with the love of God. To, uh, you know, who, who has a problem with that? Who could, uh, who could deny that or disagree with that? We can all agree with the love of God and still not receive that love by faith. And, and it is in receiving it that the change can begin to take place in our life. In case we'd forgotten, Jesus reminds us how God lived, loves. So in verse 35, at the end, he says, he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Ever think of that? Our God is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. And then he says to be merciful, and he says, even as your father is merciful. Speaking of the mercy of God, the grace of God, the patience of God, holding his hands out, showing goodness to people who are not grateful for it and often people who are morally and spiritually running in the opposite direction. And so often Christians are so focused on being right that they forget to be kind. They, they're so uh, busy trying to win that they forget to be merciful. And, and what Jesus is saying is, that's not how he has loved us. That's not how he has uh, ministered to us. That, that's... If, if that was his attitude, we would never have uh, begun a relationship with him. He would never have gone to the cross. He would never have drawn us to himself. Jesus died for you when there was nothing to love about you. And he is patient with you when there's no human reason for him to do so. Grace, mercy, coming to us when we don't deserve him to do so is at the heart of our understanding of our God and it's at the heart of what he calls to imitate and to reflect in our own lives. Now, there was a trend of years back, maybe you've never heard of this, uh, it's not all that 
big anymore. People used to have little bracelets that would say WWJD. What would Jesus do? There was a movement to have people to just be thinking about that all the time. You'd go around and you'd be in a situation and you'd ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? And it would, it would get people thinking. I think it was you know, fairly helpful thinking about how Jesus would respond in various circumstances. And it was good to help people to think about what the, uh, what the Christian response is. It didn't, however, help us to know how on earth do I do that? Because our, our response isn't typically uh, the same as Jesus'. And so if we're going to deal with a circumstance as Jesus did, we, we need something more than just what would Jesus do. And so what Jesus shows us here is how you get to WWJD is asking a different question. Not just what would Jesus do, you ask WDJD, which is, what did Jesus do? Think through all that Jesus has done for you, all that Jesus has accomplished on your behalf. Think of the different ways that he has reflected this love that we are called to share, how he has ministered personally to you and shown the kind of love that he calls us to show to others. And if we don't ask the what did Jesus do question, if we don't reflect on the love that he has already shown in our lives, we don't have the power to then demonstrate that love to others. We love because he first loved us. And so if that love that he has first showed us hasn't captured our heart, hasn't taken root in our soul, we don't have the power then to share it with others. So how is Jesus calling you to love? Probably many of you, most of you, could say, I do a lot of good, but mostly for people that I like. I do a lot of good, but mostly for people that like me. Think about the people that don't like you very much. Think about the people that you don't like very much. Think about the people you don't know very much. Think of what you could do good for them. How could you put them on your agenda? Think of how you could show kindness and generosity uh, to, to those people. Jesus calls us to bless those who curse you. And the simplest and probably the most important way that you can do this is by showing uh, through your words, that show, sh- bless them with your words. Bless them with how you speak to them. Bless them with how you speak about them. All the difficult people in your life, all the people that otherwise great you and make you want to honk your horn, speak graciously of them. Speak words of, uh, of blessing and kindness. And finally, Jesus talks to us about what, we, what we're praying about. He deals with our prayer lists. And I'm sure that most of your prayer requests are filled with things that you want to pray for yourself and you're praying about people you like and people that like you. Put your enemies on your prayer list. Begin to pray for people that don't like you very much, people that you struggle to love. And as we begin to pray for them, maybe God will begin to change us to make us a better reflection of his love, his grace, his mercy, and his kindness. Let's look to him now in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for being such a merciful, gracious God. Thank you for loving us when there wasn't anything to like about us. And thank you for the patient love that you still show, even when we're still slow slow to learn. Give us more of your love. Show us more of your grace. Help us to be more like you. You know that we often just love ourselves. Help us to love others. Help us to love people that don't love us. People that we struggle to love. 
Show us how we can do good to the people we don't care for. Teach us to use words to bless them. And help us to remember them in prayer. To bring them before you and to pray for your blessing. Knowing that we were once your enemies. We were once the people who caused you such grief. And in your mercy, you called us to yourself. Your son paid the price. And we received the greatest gift that we could ever have received. We praise you for that great gift of your love. In Jesus' name.